and, um, and we're gonna get rolling. Y'all ready for some word? Yeah. Man, I tell you what, I'm ready. Uh, um, I just felt like it was a t-shirt kind of day, praise the Lord, and uh, I, I, got a, I got a pastor friend of mine, he watches on last night, he jokes with me, he, and, he, and uh, a couple weeks ago I wore a t-shirt, and he, and he laughed, he sent me a text, he said, so really, you preaching in a t-shirt? And, and, I, and I said, man, what's wrong with that? He said, well, most pastors don't preach in a T-shirt. And I text him back and said, well, most pastors don't praise like I do. <laughs> and uh, the spirit of sweat will fall upon me, praise the Lord. I just felt like it was, I just feel loose today. I want us to have a good time in the Holy Ghost. And uh, I do got a word for you, praise the Lord. But I want to... Um, I want to challenge you this morning, but also I want us to enjoy this this morning. I think this is a word. This is one of those words where I think at the end of it, you're going to be like, man, that was, I enjoyed that, God. Thank you. And I hope you understand. You need, when you walk out of church, see, uh, you know, we, we see so many people leave church broken up. My prayer is that you don't get broken up, you get built up. And, 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 and a great thing about the God, if it truly is that y'all realize, y'all know what gospel translates into? It means good news. If the gospel is good news, how can we exit the building with a frown on our face? I mean, it's either one or two things. Either we're not receiving it or the gospel's not being preached. You ought to always leave here better than you came. Because not only have you been in the corporate anointing, the manifested presence of God, but you've also heard the word of God. And the word of God is... Man now, it will challenge you, okay? It will, and, and how many of you know that the word does tear down? It doesn't tear you down, it tears things down. And God will, yeah, sometimes God's got to tear some things down so he can build back up, right? And so, uh, so I just want to, I want to, I want to challenge you this morning to really receive the, and just enjoy it, bask in it. And I'm believing that the Holy Spirit's going to teach us some stuff. We spent the last couple of weeks talking about water. We talked the first week about the water and the wilderness, the baptism and the temptations, the, the kind of the journey that we take on this, on this long walk with Jesus. And then last week, we met Jesus. We had a, a meeting with Jesus and this Samaritan woman at the well. And we talked about how we drink. It's the living water. And how once you drink this living water, you continuously drink of it. Once you've tasted and seen that it is good, then you want to continually drink from the well that Jesus provides us. I want to shift gears a little bit today. I want to talk uh, about a, a character that I absolutely adore in the Old Testament. Uh, he's a good buddy of mine. I like pre I preached a, ser a series on him just a couple of years ago. Um, but but I wanna, today I want to talk about my friend Jacob. And, uh, and Jacob is an interesting dude. Jacob's name actually means, this. it actually has double meaning. It means hill supplanter. And you'll, I'll explain that to you in a few minutes why if you don't know. It also means trickster. So Jacob's got this kind of reputation now I know they ain't no everybody in here is so Holy Ghost that you you were born glowing in the dark, praise the Lord, and uh, and we thank God for that. But there's some of us, and you don't have to look at him if you know who I'm talking about. But there's some of us, including your pastor, that actually have a past. But how many of you know that your past does not disqualify you from your future? That your history does not keep you from your destiny. I I, I just dare some. Maybe it's not you, but can you just say Amen for somebody else? Cause I know some of y'all. Yeah, we're there. All right, I know, yeah, a couple of y'all pointing at me. Praise God, and I, you know, that's right. That's uh, the rest of y'all. Just pray for us. Hallelujah. You can intercede for your pastor. Um, but but I want to talk today about Jacob, and I want I want to deal with something that I think is important because it's often misunderstood, and, and I think the importance of it gets lost uh, in, in, in our understanding of the gospel and kind of how it fits. The Bible is about Jesus. Okay, Jesus is the star of the show. Now, that may upset some of you because I know you thought, and Grandma told you, but it ain't about you. It's about Jesus. But you get to play a part in this, in this story that Jesus tells us, and it's important for you to understand your role. In order for you to understand your role, you must know who you are. There's a reason that at the end of the movies, they have credits. It's because the, the role that you saw them play is not who they are. Okay? So you need to understand, there's a difference between the role you play and the person that you are. And what happens oftentimes in church is we begin to identify ourselves. We get our identity by the role we play. I'm not pastor, I'm Brad, okay? I'm, I am, I'm a child of God, okay? The role that the Lord affords me to play is pastor. In my, in my, that's one of the roles that I play. I play father, I play husband, I play friend, I play comedian. To some of y'all, praise the Lord. All y'all do is laugh at me. But, but that's the role that I play, but that's not who I am. And if you get the two twisted, then you're going to find yourself in what we know in our culture as an identity crisis. 
And identity is important to understand, but there's something that I, I want to, to kind of convey today and when it comes to identity. It's kind of a, an aspect of identity, so to speak. And, and what I want to talk about today is, um, and you've heard me say this before, it's not just important to know who you are, it's important to know whose you are. And you need to understand your relationship as it stands with God. Because you can know who you are, but not know whose you are. And that will change your perspective of how you live life and how you view your stuff. Let me give you an example real quick. Everybody knows who Bill Gates is, right? But what if I told you, what if today when you left out of here and you went with mama to Camino Real to eat lunch and over lunch mama said, baby, there's something I need to tell you that I've never told you before. Your daddy is not really your daddy. And then she said, your daddy is Bill Gates. Now, once you got over the initial shock of the matter, how many of you be willing to admit the first thing that would change is your Christmas list? Like, I ain't asking for a jacket, I'm asking for a Ferrari. I don't need a Keurig, I need a, a helicopter, praise God. I ain't, the, the, my days of staying at the Holiday Inn Express are over, praise the Lord. It would change. Why? It's not that Bill Gates changed. It's not that me knowing who he is changed. It's the relationship and how I see him changed. And I believe there's a lot of Christians who understand who God is and who understand maybe even who they are, but they have not put the two together to understand the relationship. Because when I begin to see him, not just as Lord, not just as Savior, but as Father, then the relationship changes. And how many of you know, when the relationship changes, the expectation changes. See, let me ask, if you begin to see God in the correct relationship that he established through Jesus, then the, the way that you operate and the way you see things would change. And so today, I want to look at, I want to talk about, I want to, I want to dive into an aspect of identity that is really about relationship and who we are according to who God says we are. So if you got your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 32. I'm going to read a little passage of scripture here. Then I want to backtrack a little bit, give you a little backdrop on Jacob. I love how the Bible gives us kind of the starting point. We can go back and see his life unfold. And so we want to, I want to backtrack a little bit, but I want to read this passage of scripture first. And then, um, and then we're going to look and talk about who we are in relationship to God. You got it? Say amen. How about stand up for me? Praise the Lord. Go ahead and stretch your legs out. I'm going to read verses 22 through 30. When you got it, say amen. 22 says, And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, his two wives. I'm going to let, I'll let Elder Ray break that down for y'all in a different sermon. Praise God. So, took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. But Jacob responded, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He responded, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Somebody say amen. amen. Then Jacob asked saying, tell me your name, I pray. Now, 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 now can we be honest? If he's praying to him, I'm pretty sure Jacob knows who he's talking to at this point, but he's just trying to make sure. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. 
Before you take your seat, I want you to high five three people. I want you to ask them this question for me. What is your name? And if you don't know the answer to the question, you feel free to answer them accordingly. No, 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 listen, listen, listen. Before you get too settled, I want you to high five one person that you have not high fived yet. And just tell them, say, I'm sorry you didn't make my top three, but I got two words for you. Get real. Come on, everybody. I want you to high five somebody and say, get real, get real, get real, get real. Warren called me this week and uh, he told me he was, I asked him what he was doing. He said he was home waiting for FedEx to show up. And I said, well, okay, what, what's, what's FedEx bringing? He said, FedEx is bringing me a new bank card because apparently someone in Florida got my bank account information and tried to charge things on my card as they pretended like they were me. And he said, so my bank called it and they canceled all the transactions, but they've got to send me a new card to match my identity. Let me ask you a question before we get started. Has anyone in here ever, and I, I know this may be putting you out on a limb a little bit, but, but just, 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 uh, just bless your pastor for a moment. Has anybody in here ever pretended to be someone that you weren't so you can get something that you wanted. Have you ever, have you ever just, I know, I know some of y'all, y'all pray for the rest of us, praise the Lord. But, uh, but has any, have, you ever, have you ever even just kind of like tried to, uh, and I'm not saying like you literally committed identity theft. If you did, then you probably don't need to raise your hand. We do have law enforcement folk in the house. But, but I'm, that's not what I'm, I'm asking. Have you ever like tried to pretend to be something that you weren't in order to impress somebody you were with? It's an interesting thing when you live life trying to impress people by being somebody that you're not. It's a very tiring thing because first of all, you've got to discern what you think they would like to begin with. Then you've got to portray yourself to be something that you're not in order to be something that you hope they would like. And so there's a lot of pressure that comes with acting like something that you're not. And then, after you have convinced them that you're something that you're not and impressed them that you're someone that you aren't, then you have to make sure that you keep it up and never let your guard down because they might find out you're not who you say you are and you're not what they thought you were. Everybody has been given an identity. When God formed you in your mother's womb, your identity was already established. He said, I knew you. See, when you, in order to know somebody, you have to understand their identity. Okay? He said, I knew you. In other words, I knew who you were before you ever entered into this world. So your identity was not established when the doctor smacked you on the rear end and they gave you a name. Your identity was established, the Bible says, before the foundations of the earth because he knew you at that point. And I know that's, that's difficult sometimes for us to wrap our minds around, but the truth of the matter is that we are giving our identity by God and then we grow in the understanding of who God made us. You don't develop who you are, you discover who you are. You don't get to choose your identity. You get to choose to walk in your identity. And we gotta be careful that we don't attempt to be someone that we're not. I can remember when I was in eighth grade at Charity Middle School, had a math teacher. And to protect the innocent, I won't say her name. But this certain math teacher um, used to upset me because of her attitude and I was Holy Ghost and she was okay 
And one day, when I was probably already just a little bit frustrated, and we were having class, this teacher, I asked this teacher a question right before we took a test. And when I asked this teacher a question, this teacher, this certain teacher responded to my question with what I would be considered to be a fairly smart aleck answer. Now, there's a lot of things that your pastor is. There's a lot of things that your pastor is not. One of the things that is a wonderful blessing from God is a quick-witted, sharp, sharp tongue that he has placed in my mouth. So when this teacher proposed what I thought was a smart aleck question, your pastor responded with what I know to be a smart aleck answer. Very disrespectful. Don't worry, it was before Christ, hallelujah. I got saved, redeemed, I had to repent for that, although it's still funny to me to this day, I gotta be honest. And, and my response triggered emotion. It triggered an emotion from my peers of great joy. Because they all laughed. But the emotion that my peers experienced was different than the emotion my teacher experienced. And the wrath of the Lord entered into the room. And so she sent me to the office. I got in trouble and... And, and I, I remember I got sent to what we used to call ALC, right? And we, it was short for Alcatraz. I really don't know what it stood for. That's just what we called it. And it was like in school suspension, okay? And, my te and we went to the office. We had to meet with the assistant principal. My teacher told me, she said, today, she asked me this question first, which I did not respond the same way that I responded in the classroom. She said, what time does your father get home in the evenings? And I responded with five o'clock because I knew that my father didn't get off work till 5.30. <laughs> and so I said, five o'clock. She said, I will call him today at five o'clock and explain to him what has went down. And I said, okay, I understand. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> at 4.45, I was sitting on my couch by my phone. Now, young people, if you were born after 1990, you don't know what we're talking about. Phones used to have a cord <laughs> that ran into the wall. I don't mean a charger. I mean, it had to be attached to the wall at all times in order for you to be able to communicate through the device. And I sat beside my phone waiting. And at five o'clock sharp, the phone rang. And I answered the phone. Now, normally... Growing up in my home, when I answered the phone, I would have answered like most of you would probably have answered your phone when you were growing up. I would have said, hello. But on this particular day, I decided I would answer the phone a little bit different than on a normal day. So I answered the phone much like my father would answer the phone if you called him at Townsend Auto Parts. I said, hello, this is Archie. Now, I have been told by even some of you that when you talk to me on the phone, I sound a lot like my dad. And if you don't believe me, on Monday morning, any time between 8 and 5.30, call Townsend Auto Parts, and you might hear this. Townsend Auto Parts, this is Archie speaking. I answered the phone. I said, hello, this is Archie. And she said, Mr. Carter? And I said, yes. I mean, I ain't lying at that point. I mean, they told me I looked just like my daddy when I was growing up. I was just fulfilling a prophecy spoken out by my grandmother. I said, I said, yes. She said, I would like to discuss an incident that occurred today at school. And so she went on to explain, and I gotta be honest, it was her side of the story. It was the right side, but it was her side. Not like I would have told it, but you know. And so when she got finished, I said, Ma'am, oh, I about said her name. Praise Jesus, thank you. I said, ma'am, I said, I completely understand and you have my assurance that it will not happen again. And in the future, if you have any issues, feel free to call me at five o'clock in the afternoon. And I hung up. And as I hung up, I would have thought 
that immediately because I had pretended to be my dad and at the point I had gotten away with it, you would have thought I would have been filled with elation. But the fear of my dad finding out about my issue in class was immediately replaced by another fear of him not only finding out I'd misbehaved in class, but now that I had misbehaved and rep misrepresented him on the telephone. Okay, I lied. Some of y'all, y'all just, y'all were, y'all been dying to call me liar. Now y'all lie. Pretending to be someone you're not may appear to bring you temporary relief. But I can assure you it will never bring you eternal peace. Because at some point in the game, you are going to find out that you cannot live up to what you were never called to live up to. And Jacob spends the first large portion, over half of his life, trying to be someone that he wasn't in order to get something that he wanted. And if you look at the story of Jacob, it's very interesting as we, as we kind of take a step back in time and look at how Jacob's life began to unfold because most of his life was spent being more synthetic than authentic. He was trying to be something that he wasn't instead of becoming comfortable with who he was. Now I know that probably no one else in here has ever struggled with this, so I'm just gonna talk to my online audience for the next 45 minutes. The rest of y'all can just entertain us by looking like you're interested because I know that nobody in here has ever pretended to be someone they're not. And I need you, I want to share some. It's not just being someone else. Yeah, it got real quiet up in this charismatic church. I don't just mean pretending to be someone else. I mean you pretending to be different than you really are. Have you ever tried to, to act a certain way to blend into a certain, and I, and I know, I know I can tell you right now, none of you would ever do that at church. I just couldn't keep a straight face. I tried. And, but, but, but sometimes we want to pretend to be something that we aren't in order to get others' approval. There's a phenomenon that came out about two years ago, two and a half years ago now. And I, I'll just give you an opportunity to kind of guess what this phenomenon is. This phenomenon now, there are actually 93 million of these taken per day. Yes, a selfie. There are 93 million selfies on average taken per day. Anybody, for those of you who are over the age of 32, let me explain to you what a selfie is. I, I count myself amongst the transgressors, praise the Lord. I'm over 32, so I'm talking to us. A selfie is when you're taking a picture of yourself. But it's different than how we grew up taking pictures. Because when we wanted to take pictures, we would call Brother Kenneth to come over to the house to take a picture of us. But the reason it's called a selfie is because you are actually the one that's taking the picture. And they have even this thing called a selfie stick that allows you to even get it farther away from you so you can take a picture of more people. Because it's not enough for you just to take a picture of yourself. You've got to take a picture with you and all your friends. And the thing about a selfie is the purpose of a selfie is because you, you take a selfie because you want everyone, especially in your social media group of friends, to see the real you. So here's how it works, just for those of y'all who are maybe technologically uh, challenged. Um, what you do is you take, the camera and you turn it around so that it's facing you, all right? And then you, you extend your arm, but you cannot take a selfie like this. Because if you take a selfie like this, the real you won't come through on the picture. Because if you take a picture like this, you'll see things in your facial features that you really don't wanna see and that you don't want others to see. So the first thing you gotta do is you have to elevate the camera to get an angle, because we're making sure we get the right picture. We don't want to mislead anybody. And, if, and it's been known that if you hold it up at an angle, it will actually make your face look slimmer. 
And now keep in mind, we're doing this because we want people to get the real us. And then we, we finally get a position and we trying to find the right smile. That's the one I want. Then we take 19 pictures so that we have a variety to choose from because we're trying to find the picture that best depicts us. But listen, listen, listen. We pick out the one that we like best, but that's not enough. Your camera has a thing in it called filters. So now you get to not only select the picture you like, but now you get to select filters. There's different ones like black and white. There's, I don't, there's one called Vanguard. That's like an old video game. I don't even know all the stuff, but there's like different ones you can pick because we want to make sure that we get the right filter so that it makes our features look the best because again, we're trying to make sure that everybody sees the authentic us. And if that's not enough, some genius somewhere probably in Seattle or California somewhere, creates an app so that we can go into our pictures, go into our selfies, and actually doctor it up like Photoshop to make sure that we can remove any blemishes because, Lord, we don't want anybody to see what's not really there. And when we finally finish this process, we post it on social media for all of our friends to see because we want them to know who we really are. And we say things with a caption like this, woke up like this, hashtag all natural. <laughs> Which basically is saying, I didn't do anything to this picture. I just woke up and yawned and I mean bad breath and all and just took a picture and this is how I look. I don't know how my makeup got there. And that, is known as a selfie. And you know, as I think about the phenomenon of selfie, it's amazing to me because really what it is, it's us creating an image of us that we feel like is actually better than the real thing. In other words, there's, there's a level, if we're gonna be honest, there's a level of, of fantasy that goes with taking a selfie because the truth of the matter is we're not gonna get like just how we look. We gotta doctor it up to make it look better than it actually is because we don't feel comfortable with the truth. Come on. Come on. Now, for everybody in here that's over 30, you're probably thinking, well, that's good, Pastor. I'll pray for them young people. I'm never gonna take a selfie. I can't spell selfie. And the only selfie stick I knew that was the grandma brought out to beat you with when you acted like it wasn't called a selfie stick, it was called a, uh, 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 anyway. A selfish stick. Um, but I thought about that thing. And then I thought about that thing some more. And I thought about that thing some more. And I said, you know, it's interesting that oftentimes we'll go through life wanting to post an image of what we want to be as opposed to what we really are. And I know you don't do this, but there are actually some people that will walk into church on Sunday morning with their best on, with a smile on their face, and they have worked that thing, honey. They have stood before the mirror and gone. I like that one. So that when they walk in on Sunday morning, hey brother, how you doing? Blessed and highly favored, how you doing? Everything's good, praise the Lord, ready to get my praise on, I'm ready for some word and all this stuff. Not knowing that 15 and a half minutes earlier, you were in the car honking the horn, yelling at little Johnny, if you don't hurry up and get, we gonna be late for church, get your behind in this car, and then they get in the car, and then you gonna start, then you find out on the way to church that your wife has set up lunch with your in-laws. So you're gonna bless her in the Holy Ghost, and then you get here to church, and you're mad, already mad because you're running behind because Johnny couldn't find his, his other shoe, and you show up to church, and you're mad because you're supposed to usher that Sunday and you're already late and you got to walk in and you're up, upset about everything. So before you come in, 
got to take my selfie. I got to put on my smile and I got to get rid of that stuff that I don't want you to see so I can walk into the house of God and be prim and proper like I need to be. And so what happens is church culture is created to be a facade. Now, I can tell by the amount of amens and head nods I'm getting that I am hitting on something that is close to home. So if you're just, I'm going to encourage you in the end, but we got to set the bone before we put the cast on it, okay? And, and so what happens is we create a culture where we have to be something that we're not in order to portray something that we aren't because we're afraid that if you see who I really am, that not only can you not accept me, you, you can't love me. Jacob, Jacob's got an interesting deal. Jacob came, Jacob, Jacob's whole family, I mean, it's like a, literally, it's like a made-for-TV movie, right? Jacob's family is all jacked up. I love in the scripture here when it tells us, it says, you know, Jacob's got his two wives and his two female servants, and they get ready to cross over. But then when we get to the third verse of our passage, what we see is it says, he was left alone. Jacob was left alone, like all the people around him. And see, can I be honest with y'all? I think for most of us, the most intimidating place you can ever arrive to is alone. The scariest place, I know you're scared to swim with sharks. I know you're scared to sleep with snakes. I know you don't want to be and have a spider in the bathroom. But really, if we're going to be real about it, the scariest place you can be is not with the microphone standing in, a group, in front of a group of people having to do public speaking. The scariest place for most of us is this place called alone because it's that alone where everything else around us that normally distracts folks from the issues that we have has been removed. It's alone that everybody around us that we can normally fix our attention to is no longer there so we have to do self-infliction. It's alone because when you are alone, there's only thing that's with you is you and God. And alone can be a scary place. Because alone is where God normally takes you to deal with you. See, Jacob had all these issues that he grew up with. He was always trying to be something that he wasn't. He was trying to be the firstborn when he wasn't. He was trying to be Esau when he wasn't. He was trying to be the oldest son when he wasn't. He was always trying to be somebody that he wasn't. And God said, you know what? I, you, you are traveling around with all these folks like you see. Listen, Jacob had never been alone. He, listen, Jacob was a twin. Let me get it back, drop real quick. Jacob's grandfather was Abraham, right? Y'all remember Abraham, father of many nations, father Abraham, had many sons, y'all remember that? You remember the hammer? And father Abraham, you know, one of them. So were you. That's him, that's his granddad. Jacob had a daddy named Isaac. Isaac had a wife named Rebekah. Isaac and Rebecca wanted children, but the Bible says they were barren. So Rebecca went to Isaac and said, I want a child. We ain't got no child. We ain't getting no younger. What you gonna do about it? And he said, well, we just gonna keep praying and keep practicing. And they prayed. I'm assuming they practiced. But as they prayed, the word of the Lord, the Bible tells us that, that she became pregnant. She was barren, but now she's pregnant. But she wasn't just pregnant, it says she was pregnant with twins. So I love, don't you love how God is? God will take you from barren to blessing, not just blessing, but double blessing. So I just came to tell somebody here today, some of you have some things in your life that are barren, but I just came to tell you, don't give up on God, because sometimes not only will God answer your prayers with yes and amen, God will give you double for your trouble, and he'll bless you twice of what you thought you would get. Why? Because he's a good God, God blessed Isaac and Rebecca with two children, twins. So, I love this, because Rebecca actually says, it says in scripture, Rebecca says, she prayed out to God, called out to God, Lord, what have you done to me? You gotta be careful what you pray for. And so the Bible tells us that Isaac, Took his wife Rebecca down to the OB. They get in the doctor's office. They put her up on a 
table. The nurse comes in. She gets some of that gel and rubs it on her belly. Then she gets an ultrasound machine and she does an ultrasound on Rebecca. And as she's doing the ultrasound, the technician says, oh my goodness. And you can imagine when she said, oh my goodness, Isaac and Rebecca are like, what is it, what is it, what is it, what is it? And she said, I want you to look at this. And so she turns the monitor around so they can see. She said, you got twins. But they ain't just twins. They're actually wrestling in the womb. The Bible tells us this. I mean, he kind of left out the ultrasound part, but hey, you got to put two and two together. It says that the, the twins were wrestling in the, that's WWE, like womb wrestling entertainment. Right there. And, and they're wrestling in the womb. And then it comes time to give birth. So they got mama, Rebecca, in the delivery room in all her glory. The nurses and doctors, it's time for the baby to come. First baby starts to come out. Isaac down there, he's proud papa. He's ready for his children's show. So the first baby starts to come out. And she hears the cry and the nurse is pulling her out. And as the nurse is pulling the little boy out, she looks down and says, Isaac, what, is he handsome? Isaac, he's hairy. That's his name, Esau. Esau means hairy. He said, no, but he's hairy. But he looks healthy. And as the nurse is pulling out, all of a sudden she's like, oh, my goodness. I can't get the baby out. And they're thinking, what in the world is going on? The second baby that was still in the womb had grabbed hold of the ankle of the first baby and was pulling the baby back in. And so the nurse and Jacob are in a tug of war. She's trying to get the baby out. He's trying to get the baby back in. He's pulling. See, see, you got to understand, though, you got to appreciate the, the prenatal genius right here of, of, of Jacob because really what he's saying, he recognizes that he wants to be first. You know, you know what he's saying? It's like, you ever taking your kids, any of y'all got two kids? You ever taking your kids to the playground and you, and you get ready to go up the slide? And, and what, you know what they always do? No, 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 me first, me first, me first. I want to be the first one to go down. Be, and they're fighting over who's first. That's what Jacob, Jacob said, no, 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 me first. I want to be born first. He, he wanted to be born before his brother. He wanted to have the birthright. He wanted to be the oldest. Even in the womb, this talks about the prenatal ge genius of Jacob. Right? He wanted to be first. You know, and then I thought about that because that's, that's really the culture we live in. We live in a me first culture. It's all, you know, I, I want to be the first one to come out. It's not just enough to me be born. I want to be born first. It's not just enough. And, you know, I, I thought about that and I thought about that thing some more and thought about that thing some more and, the conclusion I came to is it's not even about having something. It's about how we have something in comparison to what somebody else has. Jesus. We, we live in an er society, an er. In our society, it's not enough to be rich. We want to be rich er. Come on. Come on. Let me just talk to the lady. It's not enough to be pretty. We want to be prettier. We want to be er. We want to be er. Er. Everything's got to be er. Because whenever we're looking at someone else, can I just say this? Comparison is the killer of contentment. And, and, and the reason you are dissatisfied in areas of your life is not because you don't have something, it's because you don't have what somebody else has. I love what C.S. Lewis says. C.S. Lewis said, the challenge, the issue that we have as people is not that we worship the thing that we have, the possession. It's that we, it's not even the possession itself that we worship. It's the fact that we want more of that possession than what someone else has. See, it's not enough to have money. See, you think, you, you, and you're just thinking, well, I don't want to be rich. I just wish I could just pay my bill. Well, let me tell you, go to Haiti and look at what folk got. See, you're, you're judging your situation by what the Jones have on the other side of the street. So the truth of the matter is, it's not a matter of what you have, it's what you have in comparison to what everybody else has. And we live in an earth society where we always got to have earth, we got to have more, we got to be, be, be prettier, and we got to be richer, and we got to be smarter, and we got to be better, we got to have earth, er, 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 and we end up on this cycle that's going around and drives us absolutely crazy, and at the end of the cycle, the only thing we can say is er, Because we look at what everybody else has got. Jacob, he wants something that's not his. He's trying, he's, he's fighting for something else. He wants to be first. Jacob spent his whole life with somebody. 
his first roommate. They shared a one-bedroom apartment for nine months. Some of y'all get that on the way home. He was born to a family, his mother. He had the ultimate hover mother, if you read the story of Jacob. She was always advising him, always taking. And when you read the story of Jacob, it probably helped you to do a little bit, have a little bit of historical context because most of his story doesn't take place when he's 11 or 12. It takes place when he's 65. And mama was still telling, baby, this is what you need to do at 65. Mamas, I know you know what's best, but you need to take your hands off when they reach 35. If you are still making decisions for them, and they are of grown folk age, then you got a problem. That's what was happening. Jacob had never been alone. Then he, then he got married. He went, he ended up, got married, and got married to the wrong woman. And I know some of y'all can identify with that. Then he got married to another woman. So now he had two wives. And that was the first, the Bible just tells us he had to cross over with two. That's his first mistake, right? Because the Bible says you can't serve two masters. Pastor Kayla ain't here today. I hope you ain't watching home, baby, but if you are, I love you. Jacob had never been alone, but then it tells us there in verse 24, it says, and he was left alone. God had to get him away from all the other voices so he could, can I just tell you, alone may be a scary place, but it's a necessary place because alone is the place where God needs to get you away from all the other voices that you have. And listen, see, see, I think part of the problem, I believe, Pastor Tosh, is we have turned the word time out. It's got such a negative connotation to it because like what we, tell, what we tell children when they're bad, we're going to send you to time out. I mean, we're going to send you to be alone by yourself to collect your thoughts and find yourself. See, when I was growing up, we didn't have time out. You got knocked out. But that's all right, okay, I'm not, I'm not advocating, I'm just saying. When you, when, you, when you act like your mom and daddy on the phone, you need to get knocked out, I'm just saying. Don't be judging my mom and daddy. But we, we've placed this negative connotation on time out, like, like, we, like this idea of isolation is this bad thing. But see, you need to understand something. Sometimes God needs to separate you so he can talk to you. See, separation is necessary for preparation. And God has to get you away sometimes so he can deal with some stuff. And listen, I understand, I'm not saying, and I know, I know cause, cause there's about three or four of y'all in here right now that you want to stand up, you want to bring an offering. Cause you've been saying, I've been saying it, Pastor, I, I'm telling her, all I need is Jesus. I don't need, I'm tired of church folk and I'm, I'm just sick of having to deal with everybody. All I need is Jesus. No, 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 no. Cause you need community too. See, separation is for preparation. And the reason, here's why, here's why God has to separate you sometimes. Because after a while of being in something, you become like what you've been in. And Jesus said it like this. He said, you're not of the world, but you're in the world. But he also understood that the more you're in the world, the more you're gonna smell, look, and act like the world. So there's some times where he's gotta pull you back out and take you back in the wilderness. He's gotta get you in the boat and take you across the other side away from the crowd because he needs to deal with some things so he can then send you right back into the world, but you won't act like the world. But he's got to separate you. See, see, the world is evil. The world, the world is they. That's the that's what deprivation means. The word deprivation means evil or corrupt. Here, let's catch this. Write this down. This is a tweetable moment right here. Separation is necessary for preparation to prevent deprivation. God will pull you out to minister to you privately, so that you won't be corrupted by what you're ministering to publicly. I just wish I could get an amen. I mean, that just didn't get what I thought it was going to get. <laughs> Separation is necessary for preparation so that you won't experience deprivation. Because if God doesn't ever pull you out to minister, see, see, some, see we, got, we got two extremes in the body of Christ. We got some people that want to insulate themselves from the influence of the world so much so that they're no good to the, to the earth. Like we want to just come to church seven days a week. We want to have, we want to have worship. We want to have praise and worship. We want 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We want to talk to anybody. We don't want to spend minister to anybody. We don't want to evangelize anybody. All we want to do is be safe. And I'm in here, God, and you know what? The gates of hell shall not prevail against me. But then we got other folk. 
All I'm about is reaching Jesus. I'm reaching folks for Jesus. And if I got to smoke a joint with them, I'll smoke a joint with them. No. See, Paul, Paul said I am, I can be all things to all men. Paul never compromises core values. Now, 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 you need to understand what your core values are. If your core values are organ music, that's not core values. I'm just being honest with you. Because right? so, sometimes we'll fight battles that ain't no need in fighting. And we'll protect things that don't need protecting. Like, hey, some things you just got to be willing to say, hey, it don't matter. You know, loud music, soft music, organ music, rap music, it's all music. If Jesus can use it, praise the Lord. But now if you're going to talk about shooting people and killing people, trying to reach people to Jesus. And so sometimes God will separate you so he can prepare you to deploy you because he wants to send you back into the world. But don't get so worldly. See, sometimes what God, every now and then. Now, don't, now, now, when he separates you, the wilderness is not meant to be a season. All right? It's not meant for you to live there. He didn't, he didn't pull it. John the Baptist came out of the wilderness. He didn't just go back in it and live there. He came out. But there were times when Jesus would say, I had to go be alone with my father. And so, so, so I need you to understand, separation is not a bad thing. Praise the Lord. I'm about to wrap up. The place called alone is where God needs to deal with your ego. Come on. I know you don't think you got an ego. That's right. you know, ego actually means I. That's what it means. It actually means I, right? It means, it means the how I see myself. And some of us are more concerned with how we see ourselves than we are about ourselves. <laughs> I wish y'all could see the look on y'all's faces. Some of y'all look like y'all been baptized in Texas Pete. And, 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 and you got, sometimes you got, to, God's got to deal with your ego. He's got to deal with how you see yourself, how you want others to see you, because that's what you get so concerned with. I want others to see I'm, I'm not, I know I'm struggling over here, but I got to portray this. I need, I know this is what I really look like when I wake up, but here's my selfie. See, that's what selfie, all selfie is ego. And God's got to get you alone to get you away from all the influence, the external influence of other voices, so he can deal with your eye. So he can deal with your ego. So he can deal with how you see yourself. See, your ego is not your amigo. Your ego is not your friend. We think how we see ourselves, that's so important. I need confidence. I need self-esteem. No, you don't. You don't need any of that. And, and so, so what happens is because we build our ego, and that's what we put trust in because we need confidence and we need self-assurance and we need self-esteem, what we do is we begin to look for it from others. So we'll post a selfie. Do you know there's a reason why every platform on social media has a section where you can like or comment? Do you know why? Because it's created to feed our ego. So if I put a picture up of myself, I'm going to check. See, you can't even talk to somebody who just posted a pic because they are too busy looking at their phone to see how many likes they got. And if all y'all who don't do technology, well, I don't do social media, it's the devil. Let me tell you something, you do the same thing. When you walk up out the beauty shop and walk into Walmart and you be checking out how everybody's checking you out, that's selfie. That's ego. E-G-O. Stop worrying yourself. See, we find our ego by other people's opinions. The only, the opinion of others does not matter. Can you say amen? amen? But let me just tell you this. Even your opinion of yourself is not where you find validation for your identity. It's God's opinion. Ego, you know what it stands for? Excusing God's opinion. Ego, E-G-O, excusing God's opinion. In other words, I don't need to know what God says. My, I need my ego to tell me who I am. I need my ego to tell me that I'm beautiful. I need my ego to tell me I'm successful. I need my ego to tell me that I'm okay. I need my ego to tell me that I'm valuable. I need my ego to tell me I'm worthy. I need everybody else. And, and what we do is we go, we do things like post selfies because we are, are, are promoting ourselves amidst a jury of peers trying to find validation for our ego. Can I just speak real for just a second? Some of us need to skip 
going to the jury and go straight to the judge. Some of us need to stop worrying about what everybody else's opinion is about us and just say, God, what is your opinion of me? You're the one that paid the price for me. You're the one that laid down your life for me. You're the one that gave your son for me. So God, here's an idea. Instead of worrying about what everybody else thinks, hey God, what is your opinion about me? Who do you say that I am? What is my value according to you? And sometimes God has to get you alone to have that conversation. And God, can I just tell you this? The opinions of others does not influence God. I'm just going to sit over here by myself in time out until that sinks in. Because some of y'all think that God's basing his opinion on how others see you. And the devil is a lie. God has an opinion about you. He knew you before you were knit in your mother's womb. He gave you your identity. He placed value on you. And when Jesus went to the cross at Calvary, he said, I'm going to pay the price because I am going to lay down my life for them. And God determines your value. He doesn't base it on other people's opinions. Now, some of y'all clapping because you don't care what nobody thinks. And that can be honorable to an extent. But don't be mean as the devil and just say, that's how you are. And that's how God made you. I need to hit, but I need to be an equal opportunity offender right here. But you cannot live your life based on what others tell you, think of you, or say to you. Jacob. Your daddy really has a lot. You really ought to get the double portion. I had a dream when you were a baby. I had a dream before you were born that my youngest baby was going to get the inheritance. And he always had chatter in his ear. And God said, I got to get you alone because there's some things I need to deal with that I can't deal with while mama's around. And I can't deal with while your wives are around. And I can't deal with when Esau's around. And I can't, I, in other words, I got to get you by yourself because what those people think, can we be honest, really don't matter when it comes to God. So he dealt with his ego. And, and I, I just love, I love the depiction of that because it shows us the importance and the significance of isolation. But we can also find the value in community. Because it's not, you know, you may say, well, Pastor, if we're supposed to be by ourselves and you talk about life groups, you talk about community, how important it is, you know, so which is it? Are you contradicting yourself? Which is more important to your identity? Is it being alone or is it being in the community of others? And the answer is yes. It's both. See, separation establishes your identity. Community reinforces it. When you surround yourself with people who see the God in you, then they can begin to remind you when you have a weak moment of who you really are. Oh, God said, I said, well, I sure ain't feeling like I'm doing, a, I'm struggling, and my, I'd be honest with you, man, we're struggling, our marriage is struggling a little bit, and you need somebody who can look at you and say, yeah, but what did God say? Because I remember the person that stood at that altar and said, for better or for worse, for richer or for poor, in sickness and in health, I do. And you are a mighty man of God, Gideon. I know you're bowed down on the threshing floor, but God doesn't look at where you are, God looks at where you're going. So there's value in isolation. There's also value in community. After he got him alone, it says, Jacob began to wrestle with this man. Now, theologians argue about who the man is. Some say it's God. Most, most, most theologians that I, that I read about, they actually believe it's God. Some say it's an angel, but, but I believe it is God because one thing, we don't pray to angels, and by the end of the story, he ends up praying. Another thing is angels don't give your identity. God does. So I have a hard time believing that, you know, angel. I do understand messenger angels, but for the most part, I believe that really what we're seeing here is a depiction of, of Jacob wrestling with God, which is a literal sense of what he actually did. He had a physical wrestling match. I love, you know what I love about Jacob? He was wrestling in his natural birth, and he was wrestling in his spiritual birth. See, I, I know some of y'all don't like it, but sometimes you got to fight to become what God has called you to be. I know you thought it was going to be easy and somebody's going to lay hands on you and just tell you, but you need to know there's a struggle sometimes in you becoming who God has called you to be. And it's very simple, but it ain't always easy. Jacob has this wrestling match. I'm closing, I'm closing, but Jacob has this wrestling match. And he's wrestling. And as he's wrestling, the Bible says that 
all of a sudden, the one that he was wrestling with touched him. And when he touched him, his hip went out of socket. Now, I've never, to my knowledge, had my hip dislocated. And by accounts of people who have, I'm pretty sure that I would know it if it had. But I have been sitting in the recliner long enough before that when I get up, you got that thing in your hip. I don't know what that is. Talk to me, somebody. And you get up and you feel like somebody has stuck a seven-inch steak knife in the side of your hip. You're going, Lord, have mercy. you like the tin man trying to work that thing out. And you can't hardly move. You're like paralyzed. And finally, you get that thing. Whew, Lord, have mercy. His hip. So, now I gotta be honest with you, when I read this for a long time I thought that, that you know that he's wrestling God just went wow just smacked him on the hip and knocked his hip out of his eye but, but I actually looked up the Hebrew because I wanted to just see if there was anything in there and, and, and the word that it says for touch means lightly tapped and I think it, it, Jacob's wrestling he's trying to figure out what's going on he's wrestling with God because let me can I just tell y'all something you have wrestled with God whether you know it or not the problem is when you were actually wrestling with God at the time, you really didn't know that's who you were wrestling with. You thought you were wrestling with self. You thought you were wrestling with that little voice inside your head. You thought you were wrestling with, uh, with uh, Jiminy Cricket, your conscience. You thought you were wrestling with something, but you were actually wrestling with God. And, and, and at some point during this wrestling match, he gets touched and he realizes, I'm in way over my head. And he says, then, then the Lord speaks and says, let go of me. You've had all you can take. So I, need, I need you to catch this because I know your whole Christian life, you've lived by the mantra is God will never give you more than you can handle. And that may be one of the biggest lies in all of Christianity. Because if God only gave you what you can handle, you wouldn't need God. God would never put more on me than he can. Yes, he would. God lets a lot of things come on you so you can't handle it, so he can because he's your savior. And he said, you know what? If you didn't need me to save you, I wouldn't be a savior. But Jacob says, I refuse to let go. I pray thee. I acknowledge who, I know who you are. I'll figure this thing out. I've been wrestling long enough after about six nights of not sleeping in my bed and wondering what this thing is stirring inside. I know what it is. I thought it was bad pizza for two nights. I thought Camino can do that, can lock you up for about three days. But after about six and not sleeping, I'm thinking, Lord, I know this is you waking me up at three in the morning, 3.33 for all y'all prophetic people. And you know, you waking up at the same time every night and you gotta go lay down in the closet and hum and all that stuff that all y'all prophetic people do like my wife, praise the Lord. But, but I know it's God after I've wrestled long enough. He says, I'm not gonna let, I'm not gonna let go till you bless me. And then God asked him this wonderful, beautiful question. <laughs> and I love this. God says, what's your name? Now listen, we don't have to be seminary certified to know that God was asking him a question, not because he didn't have an answer. He just wanted to hear the answer. Isaac says, who are you? Jacob, you smell like Esau. You feel like Esau. He, he dressed up like his brother. Then it says he went out and skinned the goat and put on the goat skin so he could be hairy. That must have been a hairy dude. I mean, this joker has gone Hannibal Lecter, covered himself in goat skin, and daddy can't. In other words, he thought the goat looked more like his son than the brother did. You think about that for a minute. Who are you? My name is Esau. Who are you? My name is Esau. Who are you? I'm this, I'm that. But he had never been honest about who he was. He's wrestling with God. His hip is out of socket. Come here, Dad. Come here. And his hip ain't out of socket. Well, I ain't gonna pray for him. This is my dad. All right? Now, I'm a pretty good-sized dude compared to my dad. We, we, we both pretty thick, pretty fat, whatever. I ain't got no shame, man. I ain't. We. But 
But when I was little and a lot skinnier and smaller, I would sometimes go in there with my dad watching TV and I would jump on him. I, especially if I get a little bit older, I'd say, oh, you want some of this? <laughs> he played football in East Carolina. I'd be, oh, wait a buck 35. You want some of this, old man? And I'd begin wrestling. And I'd wrap my arms around. He'd look at me. I'd be hanging on like a jungle gym. And I'd be trying to twist his legs, doing the Ric Flair, all kinds of stuff. And then he would say, all right, that's enough. Like, oh, yeah, that's enough. That's enough. Yeah, that's enough. You remember that? You want some of that? I kept, kept right on here. He said, all right, that's enough. And I would say, well, come, what you going to do about it? And he would take his one finger. And he would stick it right there. And I'd lock up. <laughs> One finger, I'd be wrapped all around him like an octopus. 135 pound octopus. Ain't nothing but elbows and knees. And he would take one finger and I'd be locked up. You know what, I believe, I believe God, Jacob's just wrestling with God. And God's like, all right, that's enough. Jacob, nah, -uh, that ain't enough. And I believe God said, Put his finger right here and Jacob said, mm. He got him in a submission hole. I believe Jacob said, yeah, okay, 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 but listen, I'm not going to quit until you bless me. The father says, who are you? He says, what is your name? Jacob, having fought for 80 years, running from who he is, who he was, and who he was trying to be, finally gets to a place of submission. And he says, this is it for me, God. I'm not quitting until you bless. You either gonna take me out or take me up, because I need to know who I am in relation to you. And he says, "What is your name?" And he says, "My name is Jacob." And then God, in all His infinite wisdom, says, "No longer are you Jacob." Because Jacob was the guy that tried to act like Esau. Jacob was the guy that tried to steal something that wasn't his. Jacob was the guy that was always trying to deceive somebody to get something that he wanted. And he said, that's not who you are. He said, your name is Israel. Now, if you understand the history of your Bible, if you understand the significance of Israel, what you understand is that is God's heart. I was having a conversation with a fellow kingdom builder this week and we're talking about Israel, the country. Even Jesus said, for salvation came through Israel. God says, you're not the image of the selfie that you've always been trying to portray is not who you are. You've been trying to be something that you aren't your entire life. Isn't it interesting that the same pose that Jacob had in the womb as he was trying to hang on to his brother is the same pose. That we use as a selfie trying to grab something, trying to be something that we aren't. And God said, that's not who you are. You've been running, chasing. You thought you were running after what you wanted to be. The truth of the matter is you were running away from who you really are. Just stand to your feet for a second. The reason God needed to ask him what his name was is because had he responded with, I'm Esau, or I'm something that I'm not, 
God can't bless who you're trying to be. Some, 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 some of us are, are wanting God to bless. We're saying, God, just make me that. Make me that, God. Give me that promotion. Give me that job. Give me that husband or wife. Let me be that person. God doesn't bless who you're trying to be. God blesses who you are. And, and some of us are living life, me, my selfie, and I. You've got to be real with God so God will be real with you. God doesn't bless the duplication, the copy. God blesses the original. And until you be it before God and say, God, this is me. This is it. These are my flaws. This is my dirt. These are my issues. These are my struggles. This is who I am. Do you know what God will do? One, God will confirm that you're his. But two, what God will do is God will say, no, 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 child. I know you think that's who you are. And I really appreciate your honesty. But what I came to tell you is you're not what you've done. You're not where you came from. You're not who you pretended to be. You are Israel. You are my heart. And I really believe when you get real before God, and some of you need to go, can I just be honest? Some of y'all need to this week, you need to get along with God. And I don't know what that looks like for you. I'm not saying you got to make it into some kind of ritual. For me, though, it's every morning. I take the longest showers of anybody in history. Because I got, you know, Kayla gets mad at me because when she's got to take a shower, there ain't no hot water left. But she knows that I take, when I get up in the morning, I take a shower of power. That's what I call it. 